Hi, I'm Tina Beth Pena, and this is The Unblinking Eye, bringing you unfiltered New York culture and events. The Graduate Center of the City University of New York is known for providing a lively environment for provocative discussions on contemporary issues. Its History Forum showcases the latest research taking place on New York City's past. A recent forum entitled Hood History investigated specific neighborhoods in detail. Local history uh, comes in many sizes and shapes, and it can have something of a parochial quality to it, something of a local boosterism. I've got no objection to those kinds of things. They're loving uh, uh, aid memoirs, uh, and they are part of a process of building a community. But there are other ways of dealing with community histories and neighborhood histories, uh, and that's what we have in, in store tonight, along with perhaps some loving attention as well, or critical attention. The fact is that neighborhoods, just like the five boroughs of New York, are not separable and isolatable subjects. You can't begin to understand New York City unless you understand what's happening in the rest of the world. All of these giant forces impinge on New York. They don't determine what happens here, but they provide the influx of populations. They provide the state of war and peace. They provide the boom and bust of the macro economy. And all of these things provide the matrix within which local actors act. So same when you look at the neighborhood level. There is a tremendous confluence of uh, really, you know, major league events uh, which come to bear on these very particular points uh, in, uh, in the city's uh, ecology. So we're going to look at those points tonight considered in a grander fashion, uh, basically looking at the period from the Depression down till now. Uh, and our panelists are going to be uh, in, in this order. Uh, first, uh, 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 Professor Wendell Pritchett, uh, who is an assistant professor of history at Baruch College in the City University system. And uh, he has uh, a book uh, coming out on uh, his subject, which will be published by Chicago in the fall, uh, called From One Ghetto to Another, Blacks and Jews in Brownsville, Brooklyn. So uh, over to you, sir. Good. Thank you, Mike. In the 1920s, many immigrant Jews moved out of the neighborhood in Brownsville. They took advantage of economic growth. By the 1940s, the neighborhood was in real decline. And this is before it becomes known as a black and Latino ghetto. Um, in response to this decline, several community members, business people, political leaders, community leaders, neighborhood leaders, formed, I'm going to refer to it as the BNC. The first major project of the BNC was an effort to clear the worst housing in the neighborhood. Um, and to build a public housing project on the site. Now this is interesting because several historians have told us about public housing. And even in the 1940s, most white working class neighborhoods looked at public housing as a bad thing, right? It was identified as black, as minority housing, and it was opposed because a public housing project meant that your neighbor was going to be invaded if you were a white working class person. Okay? So Brownsville right then sets itself aside, apart from most other neighborhoods. Brownsville has, has a long leftist tradition, right, which supports integration and also supports government support for uh, public projects. In addition, the business community also supported public housing, and that I find especially interesting. They supported it because, and I want to use a couple of quotes, they thought that it would, el quote, eliminate crime, disease, and other evils of the slums, while at the same time increasing the property values of the surrounding area. Now, we find that ironic today, but that was what Brownsville activists believed. Okay? Um, they also felt that it was going to pep up local commerce. Because again, understand that by the 1940s, lots of people are leaving the neighborhood. And business people and other leaders are looking for ways to keep people in the neighborhood. Okay? So one of their visions, one of their solutions is public housing. Okay? Now, this was not the, the only part of their vision. Um, before I talk about that, I want to tell you about the racial aspects. Uh, step back for a second. Race played a role even in Brownsville. A third of the residents in the public housing area, the area that would be cleared for the housing, were black. Okay? Um, many of the activists thought that this was going to be a model for integrated living. That's really what they wanted. That's what they envisioned. Okay? Um, they also knew that blacks lived in the worst housing in the neighborhood, so this was a way of providing better housing for people. It was very decrepit housing. Okay? Um, they had high hopes for this public housing, and obviously the hopes were not met. 
All right, I've set this up already, and you know what the, you know what the answer is, but let's talk about how we get there. Um, Brownsville activists also pushed for other things. They pushed for public and private investments in the neighborhood. And in 1944, they published a pamphlet called The Post-War Plan for Brownsville. And this is a fascinating document, 50 pages, a grand scheme for the revitalization of the neighborhood. And it included demands for a nursery school, an indoor produce market, a new post office, improvements to the transit system, the covering of the Long Island Railroad Trench, public housing in eastern Brownsville, the development of the shore in nearby Canarsie, zoning restrictions on industrial development, middle income housing, new playgrounds, a new recreation center, a new social work center. Now obviously these guys wanted a lot, right? These guys expected that they were going to get a lot from post-war uh, government expansion and you won't be surprised to hear that they didn't get very much of it. Um, the idea behind this vision was that Brownsville was going to play an important part for returning war veterans, right? That people were going to come back from the war and they were going to be looking for nice places to live and if you redevelop Brownsville then that's where they would go. Okay. Now, this seems ironic to us again today, you know, the context of the suburban migration after the World War II, but at the time, people hadn't really thought about the suburbs that much, at least for working class people. So this is something that we can at least think about as a possibility. Okay. Now, the reality is that political and institutional leaders didn't give this much credence. Um, for the next 20 years, BNC leaders would refer to this, I'm sorry, I'm referring to the Brownsville Neighborhood Council as the BNC. Um, BNC leaders would refer to this plan and nobody really listened. None of these things happened. None of these things happened. The vision, this vision of an integrated, modernized, diverse community competed, but also complemented another vision for post-war Brownsville and post-war New York, New York. And that vision was of Robert Moses, New York's redevelopment czar. Okay? Now, Robert Moses looked at Brownsville and he saw a slum, which it was. He saw it as a place where he could do lots of slum clearance and build lots of public housing. Now that would provide desperately needed housing for poor people, but Moses also viewed this neighborhood as a place where he could send refugees from other developments, okay? And some of you, how many people here have read Robert Carroll's book, The Power Broker? I'm guessing in this group there's a, a, far, a, a number of people. Okay, well, Robert Carroll talks a lot about this, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend the book. Um, he talks about post-war redevelopment and particularly about Manhattan's post-war redevelopment. The idea that Robert Moses and his uh, comrades had was that New York would be, Manhattan would be redeveloped for middle-income people. You would clear the slums, you would build upper-income, middle-income housing, you would build great facilities like Lincoln Center, and that would keep people in the city, right? Or it would get them to return to the city. Now, what's Brownsville's role in this? Brownsville's role is a place for public housing because you're going to be dislocating lots of people for the slum clearance in Manhattan. So in the late 40s, or the early 40s, 1942, Moses uh, announces the Brownsville Houses Project, 1,300 units in Brownsville. In 1945, just three years later, he announces the Brownsville Houses Extension, which was later called the Van Dyke Houses, 1,600 units of public housing in Brownsville. And uh, a couple of years later, the Howard Houses, another 800 unit project opens in Brownsville. Okay, so we have almost 3,000, 4,000 units of public housing complete by the early 1950s in Brownsville. Right? Um, in 19, the spring of 1948, the Brownsville Houses opened, and the BNC sponsored what they called an Easter Purim Festival um, at the project. And the purpose of the party was to celebrate the opening of the project, to welcome new residents to the uh, neighborhood, and to acknowledge what they called the Brotherhood of Man. Such a great term. Right? Um, and this is because this public housing in 1948 represented a liberal vision a vision of integrated housing, the Brownsville houses were 50% black, 50% white in 1948, and a vision of support for the poor. Okay. Now, in the long run, we know that this changed. Pretty soon after, by the, by the early 1950s, we were seeing the trends of movement to the suburbs and also economic growth that's reshaping the city. Okay. So this vision isn't met, this vision isn't achieved. Um, economic growth, particularly among uh, working class Jews. Working class Jews move into the middle class. Many barriers are lifted finally, and uh, Jews move into the professions. And what they do is, as people in Brownsville had done for many years, is when they get a better job, they leave. They leave Brownsville, okay. Um, at the same time, many blacks and Latinos are moving into New York. 
and one of the places they're moving is Brownsville. Now, blacks and Latinos also benefit from the economic expansion, but they suffer from discrimination, as we all know, particularly housing discrimination. There are lots of places where blacks are not allowed to live. Brownsville is a place which is open-minded. As a result, many people move into Brownsville. This has a dramatic impact on both the area and the public housing, because the public housing very quickly becomes uh, segregated, black and Latino. The reason is not because many people, white people leave. It's important to understand this. The reason is because public housing isn't discriminatory. It doesn't discriminate against minorities, okay? And since you don't have option to go into private housing, where do you go? You go into public housing. That's the reason that the housing becomes segregated, okay? Very soon after that, BNC leaders, Brownsville activists, become very concerned, naturally, about changes in public housing, okay? They also become concerned about changes in the area, okay? And in fact, while the public housing was certainly going, undergoing change, the rest of the neighborhood was much more troubled. The tenements around the neighborhood were the ones that were really going through the worst problems. The, the public housing residents, ironically, looked down on the residents of the tenements. In fact, people that I talked to in the neighborhood, they called the tenements the stand, Custer's last stand. That's what they referred to them, because they were rickety old buildings. They looked like they were just about to collapse. The people in public housing had jobs. You had, there were income requirements to live in public housing. The people in the tenements mostly were unemployed. Okay? So in 1950s Brownsville, public housing was a step up, and many people move on to other housing. Um, but the tenements are really the troubled areas, and that's where the crime problem is in the 1950s. Okay? Now, um, this problem is exacerbated by Moses Redevelopment Machine, which I've already talked about. Between 1946 and 1957, uh, the redevelopment of Manhattan and parts of Brooklyn dislocates 300,000 New Yorkers. Okay, 300,000 people are uprooted from their houses for urban renewal. Many of those people move to Brownsville. In fact, Robert Moses planned for them to move to Brownsville. He talks about it in press conferences when people say, well, where are these people going to go? And he says, well, there are lots of vacant tenements in Brownsville. They can go there. Okay? And that's what ends up happening. BNC leaders really struggle with how to deal with this. Okay? Um, some of them thought they should keep on fighting to integrate housing within the public housing projects in the area. Others of them thought, hey, if we build middle income housing somewhere in the area, at least that will keep some people in the neighborhood. Okay? So what they do is they go to insurance companies like MetLife and they go to labor unions that are building middle income housing and say, you know, would you build a project in our area? But they're rejected. Okay? MetLife is not interested because they don't think it's a good investment. Interestingly, labor unions are not interested either for the same reasons. They don't think it's a good investment. They think the projects will not work. Okay? Um, they also, Brownsville activists, become concerned about public housing. Okay? And what they do is another irony. They start pushing the New York City Housing Authority to change the projects. First of all, they want them to eliminate all the signs that say low-cost housing. Okay? They also want them to raise the income uh, limits in some of the housing so that higher income people can live in the public housing. Now, this is, again, an irony. I've used that word several times. But the irony is that th tw less than 20 years before, they're pushing for public housing. Now, in the late 50s, the same people are saying, well, public housing is really causing a serious negative impact on our neighborhood, and we need to rethink it. Uh, the reality is that they're not able to convince the uh, political elites to change their uh, policies. And in fact, in 1960, the Tilden Houses opened, uh, a thousand unit project that, with the Brownsville Houses and the Van Dyke Houses and the Howard Houses, forms the largest contiguous project in the city today. Has over 5,000 units, uh, housing over 22,000 people. Okay. Um, I'll wrap this up. The response of Brownsville activists to neighborhood decline and racial change differed, as I've said to you, from other similarly situated neighborhoods. In his study of post-war Detroit, historian Thomas DeGruy located 192 neighborhood organizations operating to protect their neighborhoods from invasion of blacks. That was their sole purpose, 192 organizations in Detroit alone. Okay. This was typical of the 1950s in many working class neighborhoods in many cities. Brownsville was not like that. It was exceptional. The reality is that in the long run, Brownsville also became a racially entrenched ghetto. Okay. And I want to talk very quickly about some of the reasons that that happened. The BNC was successful in limiting racial conflict in this period, which is true. But white activists pushed for including blacks in their, while, excuse me, while white activists pushed for including blacks in their organization, they didn't really push that hard. Okay? Um, they never went out and did grassroots organiz organizing of black residents in the neighborhood. Um, another thing is that 
white activists in the neighborhood really looked at race relations as a national or a regional concern. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the, the statements of the BNC leaders, they often talked about the murder of Emmett Till, or the need for passage of civil rights legislation at the state or federal level, or the need for desegregating schools in the South. But at the same time, you're, you don't find much discussion of police brutality in Brownsville, which was a frequent occurrence. You don't find much discussion of declining infrastructure in Brownsville or delinquent landlords, which was also the case. And I think this uh, contributed to the disconnect between blacks and whites in the neighborhood. Um, Brownsville leaders also struggled with the idea of community, getting back to that. They were steeped in the ideology of liberalism. Okay? They believed in individual rights and integration. But that didn't come over to actual integration of people. Blacks and whites remained segregated in the neighborhood. And Brownsville activists frequently talked about the black community, okay, something separated psychologically right, from the Brownsville read white community, even though blacks and whites live next door to each other. Okay? They frequently talked about the black community and the Brownsville community as two distinct things. Okay? Um, Brownsville was exceptional for people that people got along. Okay, but at the same time, most residents were unable to conceive of a society okay, without racial distinctions. In the mid-1950s, the BNC tried to uh, create some kind of unity among black and white residents and organize some events around this. But by then, most of the leaders of the BNC had moved out. Uh, and by 1963, 1964, all of the activists had left. This was a black and Latino neighborhood. The result of this myopia is what I call it, of, on racial issues is the entrenched racial ghettos that we have today. Thank you. I want to talk today actually about something that Wendell Pritchett touched on, which is the formation of the central Brooklyn ghetto, and what exactly were the primary causes of that. Um, and I also want to talk about community, but in a different way. And using the example of a certain organization that I found particularly interesting when I examined Brooklyn for my book, the Paragon Progressive Community Association. <laughs> it was formed in 1932 by several Barbadian men who gathered during the Great Depression to basically figure out a way to respond to the needs of the black community, a community that was suffering an excessively high unemployment rate and found itself particularly vulnerable to um, the malfeasance of employers and also social agencies which were not particularly concerned with African Americans. This group of Barbadian men actually began meeting in the basement of a building in Brooklyn with just a few dollars to their name. Um, Paul Marshall in the wonderful novel Brown Girl Brownstone, I don't know, if, in that wonderful novel she sort of lampoons them and I think it's a, one of the funniest things I've ever read. Um, as the Barbanian Homeowners Association, a sort of famous institution which passes through the book several times. And she describes it as um, men meeting in the basement with a Barbadian homeowner's flag behind them with hands clasped in very neat suits and severe looking folk um, giving severe talks to people about uplift and improvement. And that's actually fairly close to true except that they were also extraordinarily successful at what they did. Paragron actually after 1932 established a federal um, credit union. They eventually moved into a much more substantial building on Fulton Street in Brooklyn and they began to give out loans to members to educate their children, tuition loans, to purchase and improve homes and to begin businesses. They even lent space to the Small Business Association to give advice to local um, folk interested in establishing businesses of their own. Paragon's credit union was actually established with an initial investment of only $225, and it all came from the members. By the end of World War II, it had about 1,000 members, and it had issued over $200,000 in loans. By the 1970s, Paragon had assets of $15 million and had secured more than $75 million in loans. That attempt to actually address the needs of black folks in Brooklyn during the Great Depression, I think is actually an amazing attempt, and it's in some ways an amazing story. But it took place in a broader context of federal, state, and local policy decisions 
that made it particularly difficult for African Americans and black West Indians to respond to the types of um, crises that they were facing during those moments. Black Brooklyn actually comprised a variety of ethnic, national, cultural, and class groups. But one of the things I found interesting in doing the research for the book is that federal, state, and local policy rarely ever looked at black people as anything more than a mass of minority citizens who deserve second class treatment and rarely examined any of the ethnic diversity within those communities. In fact, when we talk about black, black Brooklyn, we're talking about multiple communities, language communities, cultural communities, religious communities, national communities, um, regional communities. Their struggle for advancement, again, as I said, took place in an economic and political context. Black communities organized within a set of public and private limitations that, often guided, that were often guided at the state and federal level. And I want to talk about those some because I think they are actually extraordinarily important to setting a context for actually how a ghetto gets established. In the early 1920s, the Brooklyn Real Estate Board had already committed itself, like most real estate boards across the United States, to a policy of segregation, um, a policy which basically in which they ensured and took, in fact, an oath that all real estate agents would take to not introduce to any neighborhood any person of character or type which would be unfamiliar or disagreeable to that neighborhood. In fact, it was a racial and ethnic policy. The Brooklyn Edison Company went further. It actually published at its own expense a market survey which divided Brooklyn into 28 neighborhoods and offered detailed descriptions of the locations of less desirable groups, which they defined, which Brooklyn Edison defined as Jews, Italians, and Negroes. Paragon, therefore, as it was sort of starting up and beginning to establish its credit union, was fighting against, in fact, far broader forces than local community organizations could really respond to. Um, Borough-wide and citywide utility companies and, in fact, other private industries had already made a commitment to segregation. And real estate agents and, real est and the real estate board had made a definite commitment to seeing segregation enacted in what was formerly the city of churches. <coughs> However, what I found interesting when I looked at it was a few things actually stand out. First, at the beginning of the Great Depression, there is no black ghetto in Brooklyn. Um, one historian has gone, Harold Connolly, went so far as to point out that if, if one looks at the census, you really can't even find the skeleton of what becomes the black ghetto um, in the 1930s. That whole process, although some businesses were interested in segregation, local commercial industries were actually distinctly um, a failure at establishing segregated neighborhoods. Contemporary observers like James Weldon Johnson established that black people were physically less segregated in Brooklyn than white ethnics, and in fact that Brooklyn remained the place where, as he describes it, well-to-do colored folk chose to live. That begins to change and change rather, rather dramatically in the 1930s when the federal government armed local businesses with the ability to use public authority to make private decisions or to reinforce private decisions. As white and black Brooklynites organized and fought to relieve the credit crunch that was causing neighborhood deterioration, the federal government began to arm local businesses with the power to end the credit crisis in some neighborhoods while worsening it in others. In particular, the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, established under the New Deal was selected in Brooklyn a group of men who had already made a commitment to segregation to be its advisors. <coughs> so this federal agency actually established a local advisory board, which was made up literally of all people who had committed to segregation as a goal for the borough. The Loan Corporation, in doing its work in Brooklyn, divided the borough into 66 neighborhoods. Areas were surveyed and given A, B, C, or D ratings. And on maps, these ratings were given the corresponding colors, blue, green, yellow, or red. Um, the red districts, of course, generate the logic of the term redlining. Such areas were described as hazardous red areas. And the resulting financial boycott hustled them down the road to ghettoization. Race and ethnicity were central to HOLC's decisions. And I think that this is probably one of the most important points about what the federal government managed to do through HOLC 
and the Federal Housing Authority in Brooklyn. Race and ethnicity became, in fact, the primary means for deciding how to extend credit and how federal authority would be used to shape the mortgage industry. If you look at the A, B, C, or D ratings, one of the limitations that those ratings create is that no white person can purchase a home in a non-white area. Okay. And remember, non-white area is an area with 5% non-white population. Okay. And no black person can purchase a home in an area designated for white people. One of the results of that is that white people with black neighbors had, in fact, a significant incentive to get rid of them. That I would argue that in the long and almost um, circular conversation that historians and urban historians in particular have had about race relations in American cities, one of the things that we really need to look at is the financial incentive that federal policy gave um, for white ethnics to, in fact, divorce themselves from people of color at mid-century in the United States. It seems to me quite interesting, then, that at the same time, Brooklyn's politicians were leading a campaign against segregated sports, in particular the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, they patted themselves on the back quite a bit in newspapers and any time they got a chance to hold a press conference for the rise of Jackie Robinson through the Brooklyn Dodgers farm system and into the major leagues and the end of segregated baseball, when at the same exact time they were ushering over the construction of a segregated society um, with no real rival in the United States. By 1960, black Brooklynites were the most segregated group in Brooklyn, when in fact in three decades earlier, they were the least physically segregated. Bedford-Stuyvesant was now 90% black, most black Brooklynites now lived in that single neighborhood, and it had, been commonplace, it had become commonplace to blame black and Latino people for the economic and financial suffering that so many Brooklyn neighborhoods experienced. Thank you. The subtext that I sometimes get is that uh, had it not been for some of these gigantic forces, that there might have been a chance for the people who were there to negotiate the changes, to incorporate, to redefine what a neighborhood is. Well, thank you so much for coming. Hope to see you again.